Hello, uh, it's really nice to meet you. Uh, my name is uh, Rafaela Vukasovic, and I'm a resident at University Hospital Center uh, Sisters of Mercy in Zagreb, Croatia. Um, if you don't know, it's a, a small country opposite to. Oh, I know Croatia. <laughs> oh, great! Then everybody oh, knows no Croatia. Country. Actually, Ivo was studying there, so we were speaking about Croatia, and it was nice chat while we were waiting. Um, first, I would like to thank you uh, for making the time and for agreeing to this interview. Uh, I chose this topic because uh, it's interesting to me, and um, I believe that uh, microbleeds aren't something we always think about when we are uh, treating uh, acute patient, but they have important impact uh, on outcome. So, thank you again, and if you're ready, I will ask you some questions that are not so bad. Yeah, no, thank you for taking the time and for the invitation. I'm always very enthusiastic and happy to talk about uh, microbleeds, small vessel disease, you know, practical dilemmas sometimes that we see in our uh, stroke work and in our neurology practice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, my first question would be, um, most, some studies have shown a relationship between uh, cere cerebral microbleeds and poor outcome uh, in patients treated with thrombolysis, but some did not. So, I was actually wondering, what is your opinion and uh, more important, what is your experience uh, in, in that field? Do you believe patients do have poor outcome or? You're, uh, you're specifically talking about studies that look at pre-treatment, pre-thrombolysis MRIs in relation to uh, uh, stroke outcome at three to six months or any studies that have looked uh, in ischemic stroke patients, microbleeds of baseline and long-term outcome. Because, I mean, there are related questions, but more targeted populations in a way. Three to six months and patients, for example, do you have yeah. um, some experience if you know they have microbleeds or if you didn't and you find out during the hospitalization, did you take them differently? Did you treat them differently or? Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, so they are, I think the, uh, there are studies showing indeed that patients with microbleeds have a statistically significant uh, more like worse outcome compared to patients without and this is whether they're treated with acute reperfusion therapies or not and i think the overall idea there is that your outcome of course depends on the infarct core your um course, the, yes. acute, the peri acute management but in the long in the long run how the brain recovers and which centers are taking on different functions that were potentially lost uh, from the acute insult, like a stroke in this case, it really depends on how does your remaining healthy brain looks, right? Mm -hmm. So microbleeds, again, is a marker. Mm -hmm. It's a hemorrhagic marker or small vessel disease, but the take home message should be that it's a marker of the small vessel uh, state condition. And uh, it's only the tip of the iceberg. So, you would imagine if in a patient with high cerebral microbleeds burden, his healthy uh, remaining brain, brain is not that healthy. Mm -hmm. And this is affecting the outcome. And again, we shouldn't be only focusing on the microbleeds because often in patients with microbleeds, uh, we see other uh, associations with MRI stigmata of brain health and small vessel disease, like lacunes, wide matter fiber intensities. And in studies that, uh, that have done uh, advanced imaging, we see that DTI, there is disconnection in these patients. So I think my overall experience is that those patients might do a bit poorly, but it doesn't mean you should give up uh, treatment, but you might need to tailor it to their own needs and have it, uh, have their rehabilitation and planning a bit more compared to patients. And I know in the, um, in the linguistics field, they, they picked up on that. And recently there have been studies looking at the effect of small vessel disease, uh, microbleeds, white matter fiber intensities, and lacunes specifically in uh, how patients with aphasia post-stroke recover and what's the effect of treatment in those patients. And the results make sense because they, they kind of 
showing that um, the presence of leukoreosis and white matter fiber intensities in, in particular predict poorer response to treatment. And again, it's the same pathobiology. Your intact remaining brain uh, finds it hard to take over and participate in, uh, in taking over functions so that uh, uh, the person recovers. So yeah, in my clinical practice, I will look at all those things, not in isolation, mm -hmm. but I, I will give you all the small vessel disease markers because they often travel together. Okay, thank you. Um, I will move on to the next question. For example, if microbleeds were known previous to thrombolysis, does, for example, their distribution, for example, cortical or in deep white matter, change your approach to therapy or expectation on recovery of the, yeah. those patients? So you're basically alluding to the distribution as a, like a window to knowing the predominant underlying small vessel disease, yes, I guess. Maybe yeah. or hypertension, arteriopathy. So, yeah. Do, yeah. You, do you have like different approach? Do you accept, ex, ex, just ex, expect something else or? So, let's say you have a patient who comes with an acute stroke eligible for reperfusion therapies and you mm -hmm. happen to have a previous MRI. Yes. For, uh, because showing, of the headache, yeah. for example. Just. Yeah, showing microbleed. Uh, micro so, the qu one of the questions on how to approach that is that the microbleeds that are shown on the MRI, was it an incidental finding? Let's say the patient has five strictly lower microbleeds. So, typically fulfilling Boston criteria for probable CA. Mm -hmm. I ask myself the question, so the, the indication for the brain MRI was something completely different than mm -hmm. The predominant syndromes that uh, amyloid angiopathy presents. Did the patient had an intracerebral hemorrhage? Did they have convex subarachnoid hemorrhage? Was that as part of workup for mild cognitive, impair cognitive impairment? Because if the microbleeds are an incidental finding, I'm even I, I am even less worried, and I'm saying this because the likelihood of someone having severe amyloid angiopathy. It really depends, and the pretest probability depends on the clinical presentation. Mm -hmm. And the Boston criteria actually were never, uh, not never, but initially they were not validated to look at healthy elderly populations without the key syndromes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't take into account necessarily the distribution of the microbleeds mm -hmm. to reflect on whether the patient should have acute reperfusion therapies. Again, I would look, even in amyloid angiopathy, we now know from observational studies that what conveys the risk of hemorrhage more than microbleeds is cortical superficial siderosis. So I will look for that. And of mm -hmm. course, in the acute ischemic stroke population, the incidence of uh, uh, siderosis is very low, is uh, maybe 1% to 2% from previous published studies. So uh, it's not like a common clinical dilemma. And as I uh, discussed yesterday in uh, in one of my slides during my talk, from uh, the large individual patient meta-analysis that was done uh, in 2017 by our, our group with others, it it seems like the distribution is not of key importance, but mm -hmm. the cutoff of 10 microbleeds, it's mm -hmm. what shifts the path, the balance on, on some occasions. And out of 2,000 patients that we have data from. The number of patients that had uh, 10 or more microbleeds in a strictly lower distribution was like a handful, not allowing us to do any meaningful statistics. Um, uh, so, I, again, I think microbleeds on their own and their distribution, their number should not be um, the only variable in your decision making for fusion therapies. Then, in the long term, again, it depends which decision you have to uh, manage if it's about outcome. I do think that uh, as a biomarker of an underlying small vessel disease, depending on with which other small vessel markers travels with, is a, is a poor indicator, indicator for poor outcome. So mm -hmm. again, maybe you need to uh, uh, adjust your rehabilitation uh, mm -hmm. uh, schedule, make it, make it more intense, try to see if there are any 
kind of cognitive uh, deficits that these patients are more likely to have, mm -hmm. uh, like more these executive syndromes and tailor your treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, from my point of view, in my country, we perform CT scan and CT angiography uh, to the patient that comes to ER. MRI is for some, sometimes maybe if the patient is young or it's out of the windows of the, for the treatment. So see, on CT, we cannot see microbleeds. And of course, we will yeah. uh, give the patient thrombolysis sometimes maybe. For my opinion, it's sometimes it's better to give for migraines status if you believe someone younger is having like weakness of the extremities then not to give it so i believe uh, lots of us are actually giving thrombolysis although patient does have micro bleeds during the hospitalization of course we were uh, perform mri and then it can change maybe the outcome and the uh, medication but this is like acute therapy so I do believe, like, perhaps probably myself to have given a thrombolysis to yeah. those kind of patients, and they they were fine. So it's like picking the the best. You're you're giving your patient the best chance. Yeah, can no. help yeah. I totally agree. So, I, in in yeah, my center working. as well, we never, or almost never get free treatment MRIs because they're associated with a significant delay, right? Right. Yeah, uh, that's my, one of my questions. Do you perform MRI? the ER or or no? No, uh, the only scenario that we do perform MRIs is uh, sometimes in wake up strokes that we don't have a last known well and the MRI is really gonna help your decision making yes, uh, yes. in the acute setting. But other than that, we, we do the same thing as your uh, center, uh, CT oh, head, that's, CTA. That's great. great to hear. Yeah, and, do you, and uh, sometimes we perform perfusion. It can also yeah. help us to, to yeah. see the penumbra yeah. and the core, and then to decide yeah. whether are we going to do uh, thrombolysis or thrombectomy. Yeah. Okay. And um, my other, another question is about therapy. What about anticoagulants and antiplatelets therapy after the thrombolysis, if it's needed? Do you wait 24 hours? Do you wait more, or is it on every patient different approach? Like it's. I mean, uh, as a rule in general, in patients that uh, they got TPA, for example, we wait 24 hours to give them uh, antithrombotics like aspirin or Plavix. Mm -hmm. uh, if there is an indication for anticoagulation, it depends what's the indication. If, for example, the patient has AFib and needs to be anticoagulated, then what we factor in more are characteristics of the uh, infarct size, uh, the presence of any hemorrhagic transformation within the infarct core, so we usually wait from one to three weeks, depending on all of these factors. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, if you have more imminent indications, more accurate indications for anticoagulation, then the balance uh, shifts a bit. But definitely, mm -hmm. yeah, we don't take into account so much the microbleeds for the um, uh, anticoagulation decisions, if especially if they are incidental. Uh, mm -hmm. less than five or less than 10 um, in ischemic stroke. In hemorrhagic stroke, I think things are a bit different. But in ischemic stroke, now we have the, the timing of the anticoagulation is, is very uncertain. There are ongoing trials and studies. Uh, but for the long-term anticoagulation, now we have really good data from uh, the CROMI study uh, in the UK, where they look uh, in specifically on this question, whether the presence and number and distribution of microbleeds uh, in relation to anticoagulation and the risk of ischemic stroke or hemorrhage. And of course, the results show that the presence of microbleeds does increase the hazard ratios of uh, uh, an intrast river hemorrhage in the future. In the, I think they look at two years down the line. However, they also increase the risk of ischemic stroke because, again, they are markers of small vessel disease, both hemorrhagic and ischemic. Yeah, so uh, and if you look at the absolute risk rate, risks per year, the risk of, a, of an ischemic stroke, it's, it's the absolute risk per year, is much higher than uh, uh, an intrast river hemorrhage. So they might increase the hazard ratios of having an intrast river hemorrhage, but still the absolute risk of an ischemic stroke is much higher.
In other words, the benefit that you get from uh, anticoagulating patients with a strong indication, most of the time is much higher than the risk that you put that patient on. Mm. And again, you can look at other MRI markers uh, mm -hmm. of small vessel disease uh, and amyloid angiopathy, for example, against siderosis. If you have a patient with mm. multiple areas of siderosis, then really those patients have a much higher risk of hemorrhage. So you can use that in your decision making. Well, it can help you, yes. Great, yeah. thank you. Uh, and I only have one last question. Uh, that's it. Sure. So, um, if the title of your presentation had a question mark at the end, would your answer be yes or no? Thrombolysis in cerebral microbleeds. I know it's not that simple, but still, if you have to choose, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah if, you put, if you put the gun and you ask me yes or no, I, I would say yes. It's for life sure. threatening. You have to it's, it's, not like everything else in medicine. <laughs> oh, it's grace. You you have to decide yeah. depends on the patient. Yes or no? It's just yeah. that simple, but it's so hard to answer sometimes. The answer, I think, should be yes. And mm -hmm. as I said in my talk, in all the major randomized control trials that prove mm -hmm. the uh, effectiveness of uh, TPA, they didn't have pretreatment MRIs for the most part. So the microbleed yes. status of these patients was yes. not known. Yes. Right. So I think the benefit is so overwhelming and so well proven. And the data for microbleeds comes from many inferences and observational studies that the answer should be yes. Because we're only uh, the dilemma is basically only for about 0.5 to 1% of the patients. And even there, you need to factor in all of the other factors that you usually uh, take into account stroke scale, last known well, blood pressure, uh, baseline functional status. So microbleed then becomes like one of, uh, mm -hmm. one of the small things in your uh, yes. decision-making algorithm. Yeah, and no one is talking about diabetes. It can also cause a problem with small blood vessels. Yeah. But it's not so like hypertension, arteriopathy or amyloid, but it's also uh, yeah. an alcohol and previous stroke. Yeah, a lot, a lot of factors. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for, for your time, for agreeing on this interview as a resident. This is a like huge uh, honor and great experience. No, it's a resident great in a small me. country of Croatia, it's even bigger. It's like huge. I have to brag around. I spoke to an <laughs> expert of amyloid angiopathy from Boston. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for kind words. It was a privilege to have this uh, opportunity to chat again and discuss about these questions outside my presentation. Okay, I hope we meet in person with the, uh, at the next uh, World Stroke Conference. Yeah, yeah of course. Right. I'm looking forward.